Hey everyone, this is Kieran. Today's exercise is looking at working out our extensor carpi muscles. So we're gonna be looking at our extensor carpi radialis muscles, the longest and the brevis. And we're also gonna be looking at our extensor carpi ulnaris muscles. Um, and these muscles can be distinct from some of our finger muscles. So we might wanna train them a little bit differently depending on if we're trying to rehab an issue, perhaps uh, elbow pain on the outside here or if we're just dealing with maybe a wrist issue after like a fracture or a sprain, for example, or just some stiffness in the wrist. So if you've had any of these kind of issues, then you'll probably find this exercise sequence useful for you. If you watched the other video on the flexor carpi radialis, you might be familiar with some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about in this video. Um, and bearing that in mind, I'm not gonna make this video as long because I can just reference you here back to some of the other concepts in the other video, because they still apply. In short though, we're considering that these muscles, they do cross many joints. And when a muscle crosses many joints, it's gonna be hard for that muscle to actively shorten at both ends. And it's also gonna be um, hard for it to uh, passively lengthen at both ends. And so we need to consider this if things like range are the focus of our exercise or um, which end of the muscle we're looking to sort of try and prioritize. Um, and these two exercise options give you some, some ways to work around those concepts. So to start with a little bit of the anatomy, um, we've got our forearm muscles in here. We've got our flexor compartment. We've got our extensor compartment on the back. We're focusing on the back muscles here. Some of these are innervated by the uh, radial nerve and some are innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. And you get that motor information, the ability for the muscle to do actions that we'd like it to do. Now, when considering anatomy, this muscle, the radialis longus, is gonna come from the outside of the elbow and it's gonna come all the way down into here and connect into our second metacarpal. That's that bone that sits in our um, hand here in our palm. And then you've got the brevis muscle, which starts a little bit lower, still attaches through some um, tendons up to the lateral elbow, and then comes into our third metacarpal here. And then the ulnaris one, extensor carpi ulnaris, see if I can flex it, probably not biased completely, but through here, it's gonna go out to our fifth metacarpal out here, all right? So we're thinking about the fact that these muscles can move my wrist this way, okay? They can extend my wrist. Good way to test for some flexibility is to come down into here. It's not a standard test, but can my elbows be higher than my wrists? And then here, can my wrists be higher than my elbows? And we're looking for some sort of symmetry. And you might find that one hand goes up and the other one doesn't go as far. So it's gonna be like this, where you go down and you start to notice the palm coming away. You know you're not getting as much movement through that wrist. These might be some tests you're interested in looking at to see if it's restricted around here. Other areas, you won't necessarily a restriction as such, but you might see an overuse through this outside of the elbow. It's a common thing we call it tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis. it's a self-limiting condition. And the more we've learned about it, we've found that, say over that period of six to 12 months, maybe even three to 12 months, some people are gonna improve faster than others. Exercises are going to improve the short term, so upwards of six months in terms of symptoms. But it's one of those things where even time, just giving it 12 months, they tend to resolve a bit. That is also in considering in terms of pain as terms of resolution, um, but also disability as well, which is an interesting idea. Um, but why would this tissue get overloaded? Is that the primary catalyst for why these things come about? It's a little bit more work to be done there. Um, are there metabolic factors? There are with other tendon issues. As always, the biopsychosocial model to consider in that there's a lot of ingredients that go into why these things develop but exercises are gonna help therapeutically reduce the intensity of the symptoms that they just may not hasten or speed up the, the complete resolution of the issue. Um, so we'll be looking at some options there, both in this first exercise and the second, all right? So in terms of the passive and active insufficiency we were talking about, I'm considering that I can shorten at this end, and if I bend my elbow, I'm shortening it there. Uh, sorry, if I uh, flex my elbow, depending on if I'm supinated or pronated, that might change things a little bit, but because it's an extensor and part of this compartment here, to shorten it at the elbow end, I have to extend my elbow, okay? 
Other things that these muscles can do is they can either deviate, so they can pull my wrist up and they can go down. We're not gonna consider that as much in these exercises. What we're really thinking about is, is my wrist in this kind of position, extended, or is it flexed? And then is my elbow flexed, or is it extended? And so you can see there's some different combinations there of things we could do. Right, first exercise. So we're gonna look at wrist push-ups. And wrist push-ups are a really nice way in our flexor video, we talked about being able to go up this way. In our extensive video, we're not necessarily gonna go into here, it's more of a flexibility requirement. Instead, we're gonna face the fingers towards each other. And for a lot of you, this might be too much to start with, even just being here. So I could bend my elbows, that's gonna lengthen them a little bit. And by lengthening here, it's gonna be a bit happier to be short here. But you can see there is a limitation, right? So, idea basically though is to come up onto the knuckles like this okay so i'm down and i'm up the thing is is there's a tendency to want to use the rest of the body to help what i'd like you to try and do is push your knuckles into the ground and by pushing the knuckles into the ground you're going to ask those muscles to do the work particularly if you're getting these two knuckles here that's going to be that second and third metacarpal and this is why we're not necessarily biasing the ulnaris one, it's part of it just because the wrist is extending, but I'm not creating force through that part of my hand as, as directly. Now, in the other video, we talk about regressions and progressions. The progressions here would be to move my feet further back, right? So if I'm here, this is going to be less load than out here. And if I come into that position, I haven't done this exercise in a long time, so I'm not really conditioned. I can't get out of this position currently, so I need to come forward a little bit, and that's still a bit of a struggle, whereas I can do that version. You could do one at a time, like that, or you can move up into a wall regression, which I'm gonna show you now. So by moving up to the wall, we're basically reducing the load. This might be a place where most people are going to start. The flexors tend to be stronger, so people can kind of get away with the ground variations. Whereas with this, they're not as uh, big of muscles, they don't produce as much force. And so you're going to find that this is a better place to start. So come up against the wall. Again, you're in this kind of position. And then you're looking to go like this. And I'm pushing through these knuckles here, right? I'm trying to create a fixation point here so that my wrist has to shorten by bringing this end closer to this end. So I'm in here and I push up. Nice, pretty straightforward. And you just go in until you feel a sense of fatigue. Just choose an elbow flex or straight that is comfortable for you. But in time, we wanna prioritize the wrist. So you're gonna to work towards a straight elbow over time, maybe over 12 weeks but it's okay to start with a bit of a bent elbow too. Just do what's tolerable. You might find that in here is where you get most of your symptoms or your fatigue or I've had enough of a workout. That's the tendons more than anything. You might be looking more in time to get a sense of fatigue through here, but if you're getting it mostly in here, don't go necessarily to the point of max fatigue where you're like, I can't lift anymore. Just give yourself a sense of, oh, I've had a bit of a workout just because this tissue in here responds differently to load to the muscle tissue and muscles tend to adapt a lot quicker. So you might be looking at fatigue here as a sense of, yep, had a workout, I've lost power, I can't push again. Whereas here it's like, okay, this is feeling a bit tough, but my symptoms are getting a bit uncomfortable, so I'm not gonna push through that, but I may still have some reps left in the tank. All right. So let's have a look at our second exercise, looking at maybe how we might bias the elbow uh, part of this muscle, of muscles. Considering the passive and active insuffici insufficiency components here are going to change a little bit about where not necessarily the load is prioritized, maybe the sequence of firing in terms of like a proximal to distal, that means starting firing this end and moving out to the hand versus hand upwards. Um, it's a little bit different in the closed kinetic chain options like what we were just going over versus the open kinetic chain options. You can kind of get into those nuances if you want, but ultimately it's like, okay, could I do both? They're both going to help my elbow and my wrist, and I'll just stick with doing the one that's hardest. I'll do that for the longer rehab period and find some symmetry side to side. So with this, you're looking for difficulty in getting the wrist fully extended, and then you're also looking at 
okay, is there a similar weight ability on both sides? And does one get much more tired much sooner? Or does one bring on my symptoms sooner? Or does one just can't even do the same level of weight, all right? So the options to consider, I've got a five kilo here. I'm gonna take myself off the end here so that I've got the ability to drop below the level. So I'm in a flex position now. And then I'm gonna raise up. Now, talking about that manipulation of the muscle, right? I'm in an extended elbow position. So I'm gonna be short at this end and I'm trying to shorten this end too by extending my wrist. That's the range I've got. If I want it to be further, I'm gonna to have to bend my elbow. And you watch, as I bend my elbow here, I can just bring it a little bit further. If I come down to here and I extend, that's my max. And then I come up into here and I can just bring it a little bit further. And that might be the difference for someone that hasn't got that full range. For me, I've got full range on both my wrists. So it's a little bit more straightforward. Whereas if you have an obvious wrist extension deficit, so this, say this right wrist can't extend as much, it can't come back and you want to try and make it easier to extend that wrist. If you come into the bent elbow position, it's going to make it a lot more achievable for you. Now, if you wanted to bias the elbow working a bit harder as an anchor, so that might be, okay, I want to load through the elbow, maybe in a lateral elbow pain issue, like an outside tennis elbowy type thing. If I keep the elbow straight, in theory, I'm going to be asking this area to be a better anchor in an active position, which means that there's less of a potentially like a, a passive load on that tissue, which means less on the tendon, right? I'm getting a lot more fatigue sensation up here. If I bend my elbow, now it's asking that tissue to be longer, which means potentially a little bit more stretched, which means there's more tension on the passive tissue. So I might find that the bent elbow position is better for my wrist range, or it's worse for the lateral elbow pain. It's not to say that it's bad, it just might be a way you modify the exercise versus if their elbow is straight, it might be better in like a um, lateral elbow pain scenario, but you might not be able to get as much wrist movement out of it just by nature of the biomechanics of the muscles. So just some things to consider. So I hope that helps you get some ideas around, okay, maybe how can I train this extensor compartment? It's a really popular area to train for elbow pain, um, but I think sometimes it can get a little bit reduced into one exercise, which is that sort of dumbbell wrist extension. And by accident, some people might end up in a straight elbow position or a bent elbow position. We could try and intellectualize it a lot and get into like sort of the nuances of the biomechanics and how these things work through motor recruitment. But like I said, ultimately for most, a better strategy is just to go for what's symptomatic, so what brings on my issues and are those issues tolerable while I'm doing it? A lot of research coming out now kind of showing that people do just fine if they do some rehab with a little bit of discomfort once they're past the fresh injury stage, that acute phase. And in fact, some, some uh, injuries recover better if you do do that. And that could potentially have to do with um, desensitizing the tissue. Whereas if you don't ever push into that discomfort, that sensitivity may remain there. So that your, your sort of nociceptive system, your alarm system, which feeds into this sort of pain experience can stay sensitized and has a bit of a memory of previous injuries. So something to consider there. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that pain is a little bit, or discomfort's a bit normal when you're rehabbing these type of things. Um, but also some ideas around how to bias wrist versus elbow. Maybe I want to bias the wrist, maybe I want to bias the elbow. Um, but it's not to say that both aren't useful in a general training context. Um, other scenarios where I've seen this interest uh, useful is, for example, someone came in with some shoulder pain. Um, they didn't necessarily have a clear reason why they hurt their shoulder or why the pain might have started mechanically. So we've ruled out some of the potential other nasty stuff, the insidious thing that could come off of the shoulder pain. Uh, they weren't necessarily the right age for some of those things um, anyway, but it's always good to be safe. And so I've ruled all that stuff out, all gone. Um, and then what we're left with, okay, well, what's your injury history? And this person had had an old wrist um, fracture. They had some, some metalware put in, was then removed, but still had wrist uh, flexibility issues. And so they didn't have full extension. And we took them through this exercise and the flexor carpi radius, uh, uh, radialis exercises, which I linked earlier in the video. And um, their shoulder pain resolved. 
And so what was the connection there was that when they were pressing overhead, their wrist was going into extension with what they were holding, but they didn't have that full extension. And so it just happened to be then that the shoulder was having to work a little bit harder. And then when it went past its capacity for this person, that sensation became unpleasant, which is our definition of um, pain and unpleasant sensory experience. And so we tried to change the experience of how they did that movement in that exercise. And hey, their, their symptoms improved and they got back to pressing without any issues. So just some things to consider. Um, and you know, why would you choose an exercise isn't always because that's where the, the symptoms are, but you need to consider the functionality of the whole chain as well in terms of range. It's not always the case, but you start kind of where the symptoms are and work your way out. Anyway, kind of rambling now, but uh, some other things to consider, what we talked about with the lateral elbow pain, I'll post that study below. Um, just considering that it is a self-limiting condition, these exercises are gonna help manage symptoms, but they won't necessarily speed up the rehab um, in a consistent way that we can predict. For some people, it's just gonna be that way. For some people, it's not. And there's still factors that we're trying to understand better to try and pick up these subgroups and prescribe more appropriately. Um, but ultimately, conclusions are do the exercises, they help, and they help reduce intensity of uh, pain, they help improve function, and for anyone that doesn't have an injury, it's going to improve things like grip strength just by nature of them being part of the wrist. And it's going to improve performance with pressing exercises and maybe even some pulling exercises. So, hope you found this useful. Uh, any questions, please ask below. Uh, and yeah, all the best with this one. If you like this video, then please hit like below. Otherwise, to check out more of our content in the future, you can subscribe to our channel by clicking our logo over here. And to check out our latest video, click up here.